Revelation 5. <laughs> now, if you think Revelation 4 took a long time, you just wait. Who's that talking? Who's that talking in class? <laughs> Remember Miss Gill? Yes. I hear someone talking out their mouth. <laughs> she was amazing, though. Yeah, she was. She was one of my favorite teachers. She was, uh, she was a, a black lady and just sweet as apple pie. And she used to call me boss. <laughs> she hoggard. Boss hoggard. Boss Hog, and um, I think she kind of favored me, because for when the class would get typing drills, she would come to me and say, type out for me the names of the 12 disciples. Aww. Yep, she really liked me, I really liked her, she was sweetie. So, imagine, imagine how I felt, Melissa, when I got switched from Mrs. Gill's class to Mrs. Swift's class. Mrs. Swift was a chain smoker. And, of course, you can't smoke in class. So every break she had, she ran to the teacher's lounge and sucked down a pack and then came into class, and she'd always do the same thing. She'd open up a briefcase and lay out five or six Tic Tacs, something to suck on with, with her mouth during class. And she'd sit down, take the roll, pick up a Tic Tac, fill out the roll, pick up another Tic Tac, walk around, check everybody's work, take another Tic Tac, give us the lesson. And I'm going, oh, my goodness. Huh? Huh? If you say so. I went to the principal and begged to get out of her class. Uh, she must have liked you. I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you were supplying her cigarettes. I don't know. But Yeah, Tic Tacs. Here we go. All right, Revelation chapter 5. This, uh, what, what can I say about this chapter? Very important that you understand this. Very vital, very important you understand what, what's, being, what's being shown. Why is God doing this? Why is God showing this? I think it's very, very important. It, it, if, if you thought Revelation 4 was important, us seeing a vision of the throne of God and seeing the connection between that and all of the temples and tabernacles that were in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and then the connection to the human body and our bodies being literally the temple that matches the temple in heaven. And this is the dwelling place of God. We ought not defile it. And uh, so now, Revelation chapter 5, John is still, now he is in the Spirit. We see that in Revelation 4. He's taken up in the Spirit and he sees the throne in heaven, and he is still there. Everything that he's going to see, he sees while he's in the Spirit. And he's told to write all of this stuff down, with the exception of one thing. What one thing in the book of Revelation was John told not to write down? Can anybody tell me? I'll give you a free DVD if you can tell me. The one thing in Revelation God told John to not write down. Oh my goodness. We got some people that need to read their Bibles. Well, I'm not going to tell you then. I'm going to let you find it. I'm going to let you find it. That'll be your class assignment for next Sunday morning. It's in the book of Revelation. It is a very specific thing that God specifically said, do not write this down. Okay? And that's all I'm going to tell you. You'll have to find it on your own. Okay? And if you don't, I'll flunk you. Yes? 
Nope, that's not it. Not to change the words of the book. Sorry, you don't get no candy. Morning, Dee. Morning, Jared. All right, Revelation chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Who in here is right-handed? Raise your right hand. Who's left-handed? Okay, they used to burn you guys at the stake for being witches. Okay? Um, what, what does the right hand symbolize in the Bible? Right? The right hand. What, but what does it symbolize? The right hand of God symbolizes something. It represents something. There's a theme attached to it. No. Well, I'll tell you what. It's a good thing you came to this class because you're about to find out. I am the teacher. I only wish I had an 80-yard stick. I could reach all of you with it. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. Why is it on the right hand? Why can't he hold it in the left hand? Why is it in the right hand? Written within and on the back side. And it's sealed with seven seals. What does it mean to be sealed? We're going we're gonna to cover all this stuff. So you don't, you don't want to miss any of this. This is good stuff. Yes, David. 10-4, good buddy. Yep, David just stole everybody's prize. He got the prize. Oh, listen to him. JR's going, I found it at the same time he did, right after he said it. <laughs> it is Revelation 10, 4. The seven thunders uttered their voices. And as soon as they uttered their voices, John was about to write. And God said, write, seal up the sayings and write them not. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll get to what those seven thunders were when we, get, when we get to Revelation 10. But anyway, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. This is very important. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth nor neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. That seems a little weird, doesn't it? Something with seven eyes. We're not used to seeing that. Uh, except for certain spiders. Spiders have multiple eyes. Flies, you could say, have multiple eyes and so on. So it's not that out of the ordinary in nature. But a lamb, per se, having seven eyes, uh, we're just not used to seeing that. But these are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And who is it sitting on the throne? It's God. And when he had taken the book, uh, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps. And golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung the new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests. 
and we shall reign on the earth. You might want to underline that in your Bible. We shall reign on the earth. That leaves it with no mystery, no secret, uh, not ambiguous in any way, shape, or form. We are going to reign on this earth for a thousand years with Jesus Christ. Plain as day. Verse 11, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb, that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Seven things here. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him, that liveth forever and ever. In the course of this chapter, we're going to study the, uh, the meaning of the book. We're going to study the meaning behind the right hand. We're going to study uh, why this book being sealed now is in the hand of the only one who can unseal the book what its ramifications are, why this is such a big deal, why this is such a momentous occasion for planet Earth, for mankind, as Christ the Lamb, receiving the book from His Father's hand, now ready to open the seven seals. Why is this so, so important? We're going to study that out. Won't get to it to today. What is the symbolism of the right hand and what does that mean? What, what sort of, uh, what does that, in other words, what does that tell us in the scriptures? Let me read you some scriptures here. First Peter 3, 21. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. So when Jesus left this world, he went to the position, the same place where the book is being held. So you can, let's imagine God sitting on the throne and he's holding sort of as a scepter. A scepter is just a rod, decorative rod, that whoever holds that is given the power to reign over a group of people. The scepter uh, gives them authority, it gives them power. I, um, I must have been getting really bored when I was out sick. Because I, I wanted to see what was, you know, I think probably in the next few years Queen Elizabeth is going to die. And so we're probably going to see a coronation of Prince Charles, who will be King Charles. And I was not around for Queen Elizabeth's coronation, so I went and watched it. On, it's on YouTube. And I wanted to understand some of the symbolism behind it, why they did what they did, and so on and so on and so on. And when they handed her the scepter... Um, and they described the scepter and what all re it represented, where it came from and so on. The crown, when they set the crown on her head, they described the crown and whose crown it was and what it represented. And, and all the things she, she um, at one point, she, she would face north and then she would face east and then south and west. And she would speak to the groups of people that were sitting north and she would basically um, put a call out to them if they would honor her as their queen and, and submit to her regal authority. And, of course, everybody sitting at the north would say, 
uh, yes, my queen, or something like that. They, in other words, they would respond in the affirmative. And then she would face the east and say the same thing, and then face the south, and then face the west, and say the same thing. In other words, she faced all four directions and literally asked that all of those people in those directions, would they submit to her authority? And then, of course, they all said yes. Um, and so we can expect the same... If you watch that coronation and then watch Prince Charles become King Charles, you're going to see the exact same thing because they don't change things in these ceremonies. They just don't do it. So anyway, right hand. Here we have Jesus who went after he's gone into heaven, goes right to the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So now we're getting a clue <clears throat> as to what the, white, the right hand represents. Psalm 80, verse 17. Let thy hand be thou upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. Another clue. The man of thy right hand is Jesus Christ. And this was in the Psalms. Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make all thine enemies thy footstool. Another clue here. By the way, this verse Jesus quoted and used to express to the Pharisees and all the religious people around him that the Son of Man was basically God because they all knew the writings of David. They knew the Psalms. And so Jesus says to them, how is it? He says, first, is not Messiah the son of David? And they all said, yes. So then he says, how then is it that David calls his son Lord? Because... I don't call my sons Lord. Amen. Melissa, did you ever call Jacob Lord? Lord Jacob? No. It was more like Queen Melissa. Uh-huh. Doesn't matter how big he is, six foot eleven. It's Queen Melissa, not Lord Jacob. But anyway, and that's, that was the point that he brought up. How is it that David calls his son Lord? The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. So it's referencing Jesus Christ, that being spoken to him by his heavenly father. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make all thine enemies thy footstool. So he's telling you the meaning of the right hand. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said, nevertheless... I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of... Everybody say the word power. Okay, it didn't have to be all at once then. So what does the right hand mean? power nevertheless hereafter shall you see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power so if you're in a boxing match okay with somebody and he's giving you all these left jabs what's he holding back the hard punch, which is his, he don't want to wear out his right arm. So he's going to protect himself with his right hand and give you all these jabs, weaken you down, and then, pow, lay you down, okay? The right hand is, represents power. It represents authority. It represents, if I said it, my right hand will make sure that it gets done. 
is what that means. So the book, being in God's right hand, means that that book has power. The word of God never returns to God in vain, but it always goes forth and it accomplishes exactly the thing that God sent it out to accomplish. God's not void of power. God is not weak. God is not impotent. God is a powerful God. And his power resides on the right hand. Yes, a majority of the people on this world are right-handed. It, there are people who are left-handed. That doesn't mean they're witches. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. It doesn't mean anything like that. But in this situation, the right hand is the hand of power. Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. That's where, so that's de designating that both Christ and the word, the book that's in God's right hand are equal in power. Meaning that the book is just as authoritative as Christ is. And there is no difference between them. Who can say amen to that? Because they're both on the right hand of power. Now, take a look at your Bible. I've made this illustration before. Right here, right here is the New Testament. It is on the right hand of my Bible. Here is the Old Testament. It is on the left hand of my Bible. Now, in case you think, well, there's, there's that, that's just, you're making that up. There's nothing to that. What direction did, did the Jews write the Hebrew sentences in? From right to left. They wrote away from the right hand. Okay? Greek is altogether different. It was written from left going to the right. How do we read sentences? Starting here and going to the right. Same direction. Okay? Yes, David. Written towards Jerusalem. Uh, Chinese. That's interesting. Never thought about that. What about Pig Latin? Yeah. Study that out and come up with an answer for me, okay? No, that's a that's an interesting thing. I'm I'm not one hundred percent is true, but that's interesting. That if I think about it. The Oriental scripts, the Oriental languages, the Asian languages, usually written toward the left, toward Jerusalem. The Western languages written the other way, toward Jerusalem. It's interesting. Interesting. Um, now, Hebrews 1. The Bible says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There's another witness of where he sat. Hebrews 1.13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Hebrews 10, 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, there's a man, the last son born to um, 
Jacob, the last son born to Jacob, uh, was through Rachel. Rachel only had two sons out of all the 12 that were begotten. She only had two of them. Joseph was the first one. And Benjamin, Benjamin was the last one. And she died after that. Um, verse, pick it up in verse 17. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni. But his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin. And Ben means son of, and Yamin, or the Jamin, Ben Jamin, Yamin means of the right hand. So the last, the twelfth son represents the son of his father's right hand. It's a picture of Christ. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephrata, that's where David was born, that's where Jesus was born. And Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave, that's the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. So, uh, I can't remember what Ben-Oni means, but I, I do know that his father changed his name to Benjamin. He shall be the son of my right hand. In other words, my favored son. Genesis 41, and unto Joseph were born two sons. Now think of this story for a minute. Were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, and for God he hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So the firstborn was Manasseh. Secondborn was Ephraim. So the firstborn, by, by natural rights and their traditions and their laws, the firstborn should have received the blessing of the inheritance as the firstborn. But do you remember what happened? When Joseph brought Manasseh and Ephraim to his father, uh, Jacob, to bless, he brings, um, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's, who's Jacob's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. In other words, Israel was supposed to reach out with his right hand and bless Manasseh because he was the firstborn and then reach out with his left hand and bless Ephraim because he was the secondborn son. He gets a blessing, but he doesn't get as much of a blessing as Manasseh does. And what did Israel do when he reaches out to bless the sons? He crosses his hands. And now he, you remember, he's blind. He can't really see. So this is why Joseph is guiding the children to him. Saying, okay, daddy, I got Manasseh right here at your right hand. I got Ephraim at your left hand. Just reach out and bless them. But Israel knew what he was doing. He crossed his hands, leaned forward and blessed them in an opposite manner of which they were born, giving Ephraim the right-hand blessing, Manasseh the left-hand blessing. And when uh, Joseph, when it displeased him, uh, in verse 17, held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, And thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. 
He gives the second son the right-hand blessing, the first son the left-hand blessing. Now, think about this for a minute. This has been done before. Who was born first, Esau or Jacob? Esau. But who got the firstborn blessing? Jacob. Jacob then goes to pick a wife. He finds Rachel. And he sees her ugly sister Leah. So he says, I want Rachel. So they have a marriage. He gets really drunk. Goes in to his wife, but his daddy slipped in Leah. He wakes up the next morning sober and sees that it's Leah. Oh, what have I done? And he comes out mad. He says, what did you do to me? He said, well, it's not so in our country that the second daughter be given in marriage first. You have to take the first daughter. You didn't tell me that. Well, that's just the way it is. So anyway, seven more years. Now he's got Rachel and they depart. Okay. But now the same thing is being done. Man Manasseh first, then Ephraim, but then they're switched. Ephraim first, then Manasseh. And I'm going to give you a verse of scripture. Hopefully it'll tie all this together. Jesus said it. He said, He that is last shall be first, and he that is first shall be last in the kingdom of heaven. And isn't that true in all of those cases? That the one that was born first came last, and the one that was born last comes first in all of those blessings. Okay? So picture it like this. Picture the two sons of God. The Jew and the born-again Gentiles. Who did God pick first? The Jew. But the Jews became like Esau and lost their inheritance, lost their birthright. So who then was God left to pick? The Gentiles. So we came first. We were brought in the moment Christ died and rose again. And on the day of Pentecost, the gospel is being preached. And pretty soon the Jews aren't believing it, but it's the Gentiles that are believing it. And so now God switches and he's blessing all the Gentiles all over the world. But one of these days, when it's time for the time of the Gentiles to be done, God is going to go back to the Jews and give them their blessing. But they're going to have to wait last in order to get it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, anyway, we'll talk some more about this next week. By the way, what is that? No, it's an x-ray of your hands. What's wrong with you people? These are hands. Just being funny. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for letting us have church again. Pray that you'd bless all those that come in. Father, Lord, keep sickness away from us. Keep all the disease away. Lord, just bless your people with health. And Lord, help us to be part of your kingdom every day, serving you every day, doing what's right every day, and being, um, bringing you honor and joy and blessing every day that we live, Father. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word you've given us today. And bless it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.